Today we're going to be rebuilding a gas rotary vane septic aerator motor slash pump. So we've got two of them here. This one I just rebuilt so that way I could get all the tools lined up that I needed. And then this is the one we're going to rebuild. So let's take a look at these. They are for Clearstream. They are the CS103E6 model. I believe that has become obsolete and replaced by another gas rotor vane motor. But regardless, these can be rebuilt. So generally what happens with these is the veins go bad. And some people, they just pull the veins out and replace them. And sometimes that's just fine. But what I do is I do a full rebuild. I disassemble them and I replace the veins and the bearings. I don't rewind the motors because that's not cost effective. But let's go through some of the tools that we're going to need. This is my control panel. It has the 7 amp breaker on it so I don't end up cooking windings if they happen to be grounded. Got a switch. Turn this one on. It's pulling 1.06 amps. 114 watts. So that thing's running good. I can't hook up a meter to it right now to check for airflow because I don't have um, attachment on this one. Now if you deal with aerators, you, you should have one of these gauges. This is a Dwyer SCFM air gauge. It goes from 0 to 10 CFM or SCFM. You use that to check the airflow coming out of the aerator because sometimes these things are running and they are blowing air but they're only pushing like 1 CFM. If your aerator system requires 3 or 4 CFM, that's not enough. So that's what this is. And this gauge on the top is for checking for leaks within the uh, line from the, the motor to the, uh, the tank. So that's what that's about. You would um, seal up the end in the tank and then pressurize this and then close the valve here and make sure it holds air. And that's what that is. So we got some cleaner for cleaning the motor, some dry lube for the metal parts in there, a few sockets. I'm not going to go through the specific sizes because you should just have a socket set. Motor, we're going to use that to mark positions of the end caps before we take it apart. A two jaw puller works really well. I know in the, the jet aerator videos I used, um, I used a bearing splitter, but the way these are designed, the two jaw puller works a lot better. Anti-seize, gonna use a little bit of that. Your rebuild kit has the veins, gaskets, new filters, o-rings. A little pry bar, this is actually for drum brakes, for adjusting drum brakes, but it works really well for these. A flat screwdriver, feeler gauge, the one that I'm using right here is 15 ten thousandths. Some people would call that 15 thousandths. Either way is correct, but you know, technically speaking, because there's there's four positions here, the fourth position, you got tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousandths, and you always use the last position shown as your finishing number. So this is 15 ten thousandths, but some people would call it 15 thousandths, and that's okay. And then you're gonna need two bearings. These are the um, 6203 bearings, two of them. Bearing pusher, three quarter inch pipe that's been cut and flattened. Brass hammer, that's just for putting a couple screws in. Crescent wrench, pliers, and you could really use a torque wrench. This is a, a dial style because you need to torque a few bolts in here to between 90 and 120, I don't like that they give you a range, so I set it at 100, and your typical click type torque wrenches for inch pounds start at 120, so that's why I use the dial style. And optional tools are beer. You might want beer for this. First thing we're gonna wanna do is remove these two things off of here. This is, this is the outlet, this is a check valve, and this is where it would connect to your airline, and this is the intake filter, and. If you're familiar with these, you might notice that it's missing a little cap that goes on top to hold these down. And that's probably a reason why this motor is locked up, because it was sucking dirt through there. Now this is generally just hand tight. So we're going to take that off, set it aside, and these are going to go in the garbage because they're old and used. And then so you can just take a wrench and put it on there and give it a little spin. 
We'll set that aside. All right, next we're gonna wanna pull this plastic cover off here. Inside of here is a cooling fan. And as you can see, it's full of dirt. So it wasn't getting proper airflow to cool the motor down. So that wasn't good. That's probably another part of the reason why it's locked up. And I've noticed this a lot with these because, um, so we actually took over some contracts for about 200 of these, these type of systems from another company that just, they couldn't do it anymore. I mean, the guy that actually cared about these, he died. So this was pushed off onto a couple of other people and they just, they weren't doing a good job. From the way the customers have talked, they said that they would, they would show up, they'd park, they'd run up to the door and put a tag on their door saying they inspected it and then they would take off without actually going back there and looking at anything. And I don't really get that. I mean, it's it's a pretty easy job to go out and um, change filters on these things and look them over, change some diffusers. And it's unfortunate because then, you know, now we got to deal with these customers and they look at you like you're a scam artist because of what they've been through. And some of them have even said that they felt like the previous company was just extorting money out of them. They said that they were threatening to turn them in if they didn't buy a service contract from them not the proper way to do a business so that's probably part of the reason why i take such care rebuilding all these motors so after you've got all four of your screws out this plastic cover is very brittle that's where this little pry bar comes in handy you want to there, there is this little tab that locks over this metal piece right there and you need to pry that tab up just a little bit to get it released and this they will break so easy so you have to just barely pry it up and switch to another one barely pry that one up come back to this one and usually if you just get two of them to release you can get this cover off if you happen to break these tabs off it's not a huge deal I think they're just for helping center it all up. All right, I had to get all of them undone. Yeah, look at that. That's pretty bad. We need to take this plastic fan off there. I've actually got the motor to free up, but... And it'll spin pretty easy, but... um. I don't hear any veins dropping. Normally when you turn this, you hear click, 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 click from the veins dropping as they rotate, but it's not doing that. So we're gonna get it I'm gonna take apart. your pliers and squeeze this little clamp and slowly work it off because you don't want to break this fan. Now we want to get this fan off of here. You gotta be careful with this thing too. Take your pry bar and just slowly start working it off. Sometimes these fans, they spin on there too, because there's, there's a flat spot, and there's a flat spot on the fan too. And if, they, if these fans somehow spun, you really need to move the fan back to that flat spot. But since this is turning, that probably didn't happen. So these few plastic parts, I'm gonna take them in the house, I'm gonna wash them out. Now that I got all the plastic pieces off, I like to uh, try to clean it up a little bit before I even start working on it. We got this thing pretty clean. Now I forgot to take out the filters from this end. This is an inlet filter and an outlet filter. They work in combination with the filter that went on top there. But you can see all this this black coming out of here. That's vein material, so that means that the veins are probably destroyed in there. So take your pliers and give it a little wiggle. Pull this one out first to see what's going on in there. Oh yeah, that's covered in carbon. So we're gonna wash these two inside and then these will get thrown away. The kit comes with new ones. There's also two O-rings here. They are seized up pretty well. Those are gonna get discarded as well. 
If you watched my last video on rebuilding the jet aeration motor, I kind of talked a little bit about the legality of using a non-jet brand motor in your aeration unit if it's a jet system. And I kind of explained that it's technically illegal to put someone else's motor into a jet system. And it would be the same with the these Clearstream systems that use this type of motor. And so I was kind of wanting to go through the code a little bit where it specifically clarifies that. Now, this is the Illinois code, so if you're in another state, it might be a little bit different, but it probably follows the same principles. But anyway, so this is section 905-100, paragraph L, I guess. And it says, private sewage disposal installation contractors or homeowners who maintain or service aerobic treatment plants and NSF International ANSI Standard 40 wastewater treatment systems shall be required to maintain the integrity of the NSF International seal or the seal of a laboratory approved by ANSI to determine compliance with NSF International ANSI Standard 40. Only component parts approved for use in an individual plant may be used. So it, there's a little bit more to that, but basically what it's saying is the NSF International seal or National Sanitation Foundation they would have to approve any alternative motors that were to go into a, a clear stream system or a jet system or a uh, what's that one called hydro action system nsf international would have to approve an alternative motor to go in that and and they won't do that so that's why it makes it illegal to put a um let's see what is this one like uh, that one there, Septic Solutions, they sell an alternative. And they even say on the website, they talk about the legality. But what I found interesting was when you look at these, the ones for the clear streams, it doesn't talk about the legality. But I kind of suspect that to use anything other than this OEM motor, even though you can buy gas motors that look just like this, only they don't say clear stream on them. I kind of think that that might actually be illegal to just take a gas motor and, and throw it in a system because this specific motor was approved for that specific aerator system. And if you put in another gas motor, it might be a little bit different. Different. It might push out harder or push out less. So it's, it's something to think about with um, rebuilding these and replacing these with others. So it is in the code. It does say it's illegal to use anything other than what was approved for that specific system. So you just kind of got to gotta watch for that. But like I said, around here, that kind of stuff is not inspected. But if you live somewhere else where you got um, your, your local health department looking at your systems, then they, they might raise an issue with that. Now, with these gas ones... No one's going to look at this and, and, you know, look for something that specifically says Clearstream on it. They're not going to do that. So if you were to replace a Clearstream motor like this with just a generic gas one that could be even for a pond aerator, no one's going to notice it. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. And, you know, but it, that's, that's your own discretion there. All right, let's take off the end covers here. I had to turn on the torpedo here because it is very cold. about damaging this gasket the new kit comes with a new one scrape it as much as you can if you got to use a wire wheel that's fine I'm actually gonna use my blast cabinet but for these particular motors a blast cabinet isn't a necessity like a jet aerator it really is but these it's you can you can clean it up without using a blast cabinet you can just use a a wire wheel with like a brass brush but you got to be careful with this I wouldn't use a steel brush on this because this is uh, aluminum well it's probably it's probably actually a magnesium and aluminum alloy because pure aluminum would be really irresponsible for anyone to use because it's so it's easy to it corrodes so easy so most people would not manufacture something using pure aluminum Alright, I'm gonna I'm gonna blast the rest of that off with the blast cabinet. 
And now we want to get these bolts out. Now sometimes I end up blasting these bolts, but these aren't really rusty. Not too rusty, so I'm not going to do that. Okay, so here's what the veins are looking like. They're they're in pretty rough shape. Yeah, they're all broken apart. They're supposed to fill that whole thing. So, yeah, that's just the problem with this one. The veins have been destroyed. So we're gonna take these uh, Allen screws out. We can, we can take this off right now too. But we're gonna take these Allen screws out and we can take this piece out. There's a lot of vein material just sitting there too. There's what's left of the veins. Just kind of, they're kind of there. I'm gonna dump this over the trash can. We're getting pretty stripped down now. Now we wanna get the case apart. So we're gonna take this 11 30 second socket. You can usually just put your finger on the other side of the bolt and undo it. Put the nut back on there for safekeeping. And then there's three more. All right, now that we got all these bolts out, all four of them, we wanna do some reference marks. Cause this cap and this cap can both come off. Usually this one ends up staying on, but sometimes it comes out, so it'll just make it easier if you have some reference marks to line everything back up when you're done. Now we can line that one up, and we can line that one up. So this is an induction motor with capacitor start, so we don't have to worry too much about a centrifugal switch in there holding anything up. Sometimes if you don't see this box on top, what's inside of here is a capacitor. If you don't see one of these on top, you have to take it a little bit slower when pulling these apart because there's probably going to be um, wires coming out of there. So you got to be careful with that. But this one's capacitor start, so there's not going to be anything to hold anything up unless a wire happens to get caught. So just keep that in mind. So we want to turn it on end again. And now we're going to use the two jaw puller. We're gonna start pulling all this off. This should be the only end that we need to pull off like this. Because after this is pulled off, everything else should just come out, depending on rust. It doesn't look like anything is happening, does it? But if you look down here, you can see it's pulling this all apart. off and we want to take this this little this little ring out I want to get that off right now because this will hang things up and you don't want to damage this because I don't even know what that's called so if you damage it I don't know how you get a new one get that out of there do is I'm going to blow this out with compressed air. So 
now we're going to pull the bearings off. Now there is this little fiber disc on here. It's not very easy to get off with like a screwdriver or pry bar so I try to just leave it on there and pull it off with the bearing. discard both these bearings so in my case all these are going into the blast cabinet and this is all waiting to be reassembled now there is a wave spring washer in there so you want to be mindful of that I need to order a bunch of those but the, those are very elusive I found some on McMaster car but I'm not exactly sure that they're the right ones so I think I'm, that's going to be something I'm just going to have to order them and see if they're right. But So the uh, the blast cabinet isn't entirely necessary with these because they're, they're generally in pretty decent shape. They're not full of rust. They're not getting painted. But if you don't have a blast cabinet, you could sit here with one of these red scotch bright and polish up the shaft, you know, polish all that up, clean all this up. But since I have a blast cabinet, I'm going to use it. Now my goal is not to take paint off. so as I'm blasting things like this, like see the edges have paint, I'm gonna be blasting like that, just to try to even up these surfaces. Same for the inside, I'm gonna be blasting from the inside out. This rotor is getting fully blasted. I'm gonna blast into those grooves. Um, this one could be fully blasted because it's not been painted. And then because this is that aluminum magnesium alloy you want to be a little bit careful when blasting because you could eat into this and the grit that i use is crushed glass i don't use silica sand because that would absolutely destroy this the crushed glass it's very safe it's it's good for taking off rust and paint but not much metal damage so i'm going to blast the entire inside of this i'm going to avoid blasting any outside blasted and they they look beautiful don't they but they are bare metal so I need to protect them with this dry loop okay now I'm gonna have to stop for right now because it's like nine o'clock so I just I really need to go home and I'll, I'll finish up this tomorrow but the next step will be putting the bearings on there and reassembly we're gonna start out with the uh, putting the bearings on here now this side with the, uh, the flats ground into it, that's usually the one that's tough to get the bearing started. So I like to start with that one. Put on a block of wood. Just make sure your pusher is only pushing on the, the center part. You don't want to push the outer part because that'll damage the ball bearings in there. side on. Now before we forget about it, let's go ahead and put that fiber disc back on. Go ahead and 
Let's set this in there. And we're going to take the motor housing. Hold these wires out of the way. Drop that down. Line up our marks. And now we're going to bolt this together. You want to get all these started before you do any tightening. Alright, now that we got all the bolts started, make sure your lines are still lined up. And then we just want to start snugging everything down. Don't want to tighten anything, you want to move around and just tighten each one up a little bit. And then once everything gets all snugged up, then you can tighten it. There we go. Make sure it still spins freely. up on it. You need this little piece that I don't know what it's called. Put that on there. And you're gonna need your 15 10 thousandths feeler gauge too. So this rotor it doesn't it's gonna go on either way. It doesn't really matter but what you got to be careful for is when you push this rotor on it can make this this piece right here it could slide down and you won't notice it until you destroy that thing. So you want to kind of have your fingers in there a little bit. Get this on there. Make sure it's still in there. You don't want to knock it all the way down yet. So now you want to take your, your 15 10 thousandths feeler gauge and put it in there. And you just want it to barely, barely touch it. Just keep moving back and forth like knock it down slowly. There we go. The reason you want a little bit of space in there because when this motor heats up, which it'll do because friction and everything, it'll expand and then it'll end up touching that and that'd be a problem. Next you want this piece and your two Allen screws and you want a dab of anti-seize. Just the dab, you don't need much. Put on just a little dab on the tip there. You just want to put it in the tip. Set this on here like that. You want to make sure these little lobes here are pointing up. Just kind of a, a reference there too. Get these started. Okay, so when you tighten these down, you want to make sure there's a gap between this and that. So you can take this whole piece right here and just slide it up as much as it'll go. Because again, that's about the uh, when it heats up, it'll expand and then it'll interfere and it'll lock itself up. So just pull it up towards the top, make sure there's a gap between there, and tighten her down. All these bolts, these and all the bolts after this are all gonna be tightened to 100 inch pounds, so set my dial to 100. This is the okay. rebuild kit. You can see it says ATO3 to ATO5, and that's pretty much what you're going to find 
Now this isn't an AT-03 to an AT-05, but this will work. You are just going to, when you open this up, you're going to find your filters, new ones of those, that's nice. These, and this, this is actually a shim, but it's also a gasket, and that's for the thermal expansion. So that's gonna go on here next. But um, what I was saying about um, this not, this being for a different motor, this will have four veins in it. So you're gonna have an extra vein for a spare because the AT-03 to AT-05s, they take, they have four veins. This only has three, so you're just gonna have a spare. That's fine. All right, so we got our shim sitting on there. Now we're gonna put these veins in. Now these, these veins, they have a bevel. You wanna make sure that bevel aligns with the shape of your rotor. You don't, you don't wanna put them like that. You want them to align with the shape of your rotor. Okay, so I actually just put all this together, but then I realized I forgot this, so I'm gonna do a reshoot. So the next step, after putting those veins in, we need to put this back on. Okay, got that in there. All right, so now we're gonna put this piece on and the bolts. I've already put anti-seize on them. I like to put the bolts in there like that and then lift this up and put it on here because otherwise if you set that piece on there then you start moving around, you end up moving this gasket and this is a very fragile gasket so you don't want to mess with it. So if you just put your bolts in here like that, you could kind of just set them right down into the holes. Get these all started and then we're gonna torque them. Tighten each of these down to 100 inch pounds. Time for this gasket to go on. Now some people glue this gasket down because they, uh, they work with the pump laying down now. Since I have it standing up, I got gravity working with me. So I don't, I don't really need to glue it. Just kind of set it on there, take this, set it on, put all your bolts in, a little bit of anti-seize, get them all started and then tighten them down to 100 inch pounds. Okay, we got that all buttoned up now, make sure you're Shaft still spins freely, it does. So, put our filters in, put the intake filter on. Okay, came with new filters. We'll put your O-ring on there. All right, now this piece for your intake filter, you wanna be very careful with it. It looks like it's just plastic, right? You know, 50, 60 cents, well, no, this is actually made of gold, but it's coated in plastic. And you'll see that if you try to buy one because they're about $30. So if you do break it, you should be able to take this to a cash for gold place and turn it in for a scrap gold price. So you got that to look forward to. Filters, it usually got a, nah, that'd be okay. Now I don't have the, uh, the little cap that goes on there. I'm gonna try to find one at like an auto parts store because I've seen a lot of things like that. They go in, in cars. So if I can find one, then I'll add it into the video somehow. If not, maybe I'll put it in the description or you'll just be on your own for that part. Now, I, oh shoot, I gotta, put, I gotta put that one on before I put this on. Not a big deal. Put a little bit of Teflon tape onto here. Now the trick with Teflon tape is you wanna, you wanna tighten it into your Teflon tape, if that makes sense. Because some you don't want to put this on the wrong direction, then as you're threading it in, you just take the tape right off. 
So I guess what I do is I put it on the bottom and then I tighten the threads into the tape. Now I have no idea if this switch works or not, so I'm just gonna leave it in there. And now you wanna put your, your plastic coated piece of gold into there. Okay, your fan, remember it's got, it's got flats on it, so you wanna line those flats up with the flats in your shaft. You gotta have it like right on the edge of the pliers where it wants to fall off just to be able to get it on there. Put your screws in. Probably should use a nut driver for this. But I have to go look over there at all the numbers and they're in the dark right now. We're pretty much finished now. We just gotta test it out. So we've got it temporarily hooked up through a little cord, through a control panel with the seven amp circuit breaker. You wanna make sure you got that circuit breaker. And we got the CFM air gauge on there. So when you first start these up, after a rebuild like this, they might be a little bit noisy because those veins need to wear in. We'll see what happens. Okay, not, not bad at all. Nice and quiet. Let's check our air flow. Okay, this is pushing about three CFM and that's pretty much standard for these uh, CS103Es. They always seem to push about three. The new AT05s will move four CFM, which is probably better, but that's just what these do. Turn it off. Turn it back on. You want to do that a few times just to make sure the capacitor is good. I haven't experienced a, a capacitor go bad, but it's possible, so I like to let these run a little bit in the, the shop here, turn them off and on. I suppose I could test out that switch too. So. A multimeter and check for continuity. Okay, so right now it has too much flow but that's because there's no um, fusers on there. I'll see if I can slow down the flow a little bit, cause it to go off. Yeah, a little bit of restriction and it goes off. It's, it seems to be sticking. Guess that's not a big deal. When we turn it off, it should activate. Huh, okay, so my, this switch might be bad because it's not, it's not doing anything now. So I think this switch is bad, so I need to order a new one. Yeah, this switch is no good. It worked for a minute, but now it's stuck in the open position, so. I should be able to like look at the uh, the numbers on there and order some of those. I should have some in stock, but I, I never do because I, I never really mess with these switches too much. So that's uh, that's how you do a full rebuild on a gas rotor vane septic aerator motor. And if you like this video, if it helped you, you should uh, really subscribe to my channel or give me a like or, or whatever. And it's not that I want to make money off YouTube. I would likely never monetize my channel because I just I don't think YouTube is a career like that but um, if I get more likes and subscribes then more people see my videos and 
And I think that I got a lot of interesting videos. I think I do a lot of unique things and I'd like to do more of them. I'd like to show off more things that I do and I'd like to make more videos in the future. I would like to do some septic installs and video them. And, and to be quite honest, in life I've actually made quite a bit of money. And on my channel I show you exactly how I do it. Not everything I do. I mean, there's there's tons of stuff that I just don't have the time to video, but I try. And hopefully in the future I'll have an example of everything I do on video right here. But that's it. The end.